Welcome to Carlton Art History. As you can see from this first slide here, we are conveniently located on the Carlton campus in the St. Patrick's building, where we occupy a good portion of the fourth floor with some of our sibling programs that I'll be speaking about in a moment. The first source of information about the art history program at Carleton is our art history website. And as you can see here from the banner, the full name of our program is Art and Architectural History because we share the designation with the History and Theory of Architecture program as well. Now, art history is a curious discipline. It's not a new discipline by any means. Its roots go back to the 19th century and even earlier in some ways, but it is curious because its name, as you can see from this slide, is actually composed of two different disciplines. You can study art, you can study history, so what does it mean to put them together? Well, art history began, as the name might suggest, as the history of art, studying what it means to make art, how art was made, how art was used, what art could represent, even what art looks like, who made art. All of these sorts of things would fall under art history. But over time, what happened, and it's not surprising when you think about it, because virtually every culture has made art in some capacity or another, what happened is that the discipline has grown into different areas that you can explore through it. And as you can see in this image here on the slide, and this is just showing a small sampling of sculpture and a little bit of architecture from around the world, I think the incredible variety of human art comes through. And because art is so ubiquitous, because art is so common in human cultures, virtually every time and place, you can explore almost any aspect of the human experience through art. And so, over time, art history has come to incorporate a large number of different disciplines. And I've just listed a few of them here. You can think about art history in, in terms of history, in terms of the art itself, techniques and styles. Architecture, which is an important part of a visual culture. We use techniques of literary theory and adapt them to study imagery. Anthropology, obviously, which is the, the study of the human condition, human history, human civilization. Uh, issues of heritage, uh, aspects of philosophy and criticism, all the social sciences. I, I could go on, but I think this is sufficient to make the point, which is just that if something can exist culturally, it can be expressed through art. And one of the great attractions to art history, especially for somebody like me who still isn't entirely sure what he wants to be when he grows up, it means you don't have to limit yourself to one particular frame of reference or to one particular set of concerns. With art history, because you're studying the history of human expression, really, human visual expression, you can approach it from almost any angle that appeals to you. And here, just as a, a way of illustrating some of the variety that I just mentioned, uh, here's a, an Iwan, is the technical name of the, the structure, an Iwan from a 17th century mosque in Isfahan in Iran, which is just an example of the absolutely splendid tile work associated with the Safavid culture. But the skill set that you develop in art history, or you can develop in art history, is as broad as the range of approaches that you can take. You will learn critical thinking. You'll learn forms of analytical thinking, creative thinking and problem solving, uh, connecting data, all things that you would associate with any rigorous university degree. But we also add things that are more uniquely art historical as well, such as visual literacy. Because if you think about the study of history, you learn about the past through the study of old texts and some material culture. We learn how to read the images as well as the texts that accompany them. That leads into a broader form of historical literacy. It makes us very intellectually flexible because we have to be able to toggle from one form of expression to another. Written communication is obviously important to us because you have to share your ideas somehow. We could add oral communication and a visual communication also because when you're presenting an art historical presentation like I'm doing right now, you have to incorporate imagery as well. To give you an idea of the different approaches and competencies that can come into play when you're thinking art historically, let's look at a very famous image, and this would be Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa, which he begins in the year 1503 and keeps with him for the rest of his life. He seems to work on it and tinker with it throughout his life. In some ways, it's sort of a laboratory for his painting ideas, but that's the history of the image. What I want to do, and since we don't have a, a huge amount of time, I want to focus on one famous aspect of this painting, and that's the expression. 
Let, let's zoom in and take a close look at the expression here. The famous uh, Mona Lisa smile, as it's sometimes referred to. The expression is part of the reason why the Mona Lisa has been so famous over the years. The painting almost seems to be awake. It almost seems to be able to respond to you. The expression seems almost alive. And that's not a random chance. You see, Leonardo da Vinci employed very specific techniques, drawing on different aspects of knowledge in order to create this effect. Now, the first and obvious thing to point out would be the use of shadowing. And if you'll notice, there's shadow around the corner of Mona Lisa's eyes, around the corner of her mouth. Now, when you're talking to somebody and you're trying to read their mood from their facial expression rather than just their words, if you're trying to get a read on what they're thinking or how they're feeling, the two most communicative parts of the face are the corner of the eyes and the corner of the mouth. And Leonardo puts both in shadow here so that you can't exactly see what the corner of her eyes or mouth are doing. That makes it difficult for you to actually nail down what her expression suggests, and as a result, it makes her seem sort of ambiguous or even mysterious. But there's even more to it than that. And this is an interesting insight into Leonardo's understanding of human physiology, but it also points to the different knowledge domains that come into play for art historical analysis. Bear with me for a moment while we take a quick look at the nature of the eye. Modern science has taught us that the way we see is based on the distribution of cells on the inside of the eye, here along the retina, in the back of the eye. And there's two primary kinds of cells that we use for seeing. Rod cells, which are evenly distributed around much of the retina, and cone cells, which are concentrated in an area called the fovea at the back of the retina. You see, light comes in through the eye, and the fovea is the area where our vision is most intensely focused. Well, the cone cells are how we see in high resolution. The cone cells are how we see in color. It's when we really stare closely at something, we put it right in that central point of our vision and bring our foveal vision, our cone cells, to bear on it. The rods, which are more spread out, we can't see in the same kind of resolution with them. We don't have the same color response, but we have a much wider range of vision, right? Because they cover the whole back of the retina. And that's where our peripheral vision comes in. Things that allow us to pick up on information in our broader environment that we don't necessarily have to see so clearly. If, we, if something's important, we can turn, look at it, and concentrate our cone cells. And here's a diagram that shows you what I just described here, right? So that foveal vision, the use of the cone cells, comes right up the middle. You can see it here. Here's a person's head that makes it even clearer. It comes right up the middle and gives us this very narrow area of focus. And then we have a peripheral vision that's much, much wider, but much less resolved. Now, why is this important? Well, first of all, Leonardo figured this out. He didn't know anything about cells. Cells hadn't been, well, the microscope hadn't even been discovered yet. But through observation and through reasoning, he figured out that this is more or less how the eye works. And we can see from his own diagrams from the late 1400s, where he kind of maps out the different resolution of vision and even comes up with something very, very close to a diagram of that focused foveal vision. In fact, we can put the two together and see how closely his diagram corresponds to what modern science tells us. So why is this important? Because it has to do with the way we visually process the face of the Mona Lisa. When we stare right at her, when we use those cones coming up the middle of our visual focus, we can clearly distinguish between the darker line of her mouth and the shadows around it. And from that perspective, she has a fairly even expression, maybe it's the slightest hint of a smile, but nothing that you would consider too emotionally demonstrative. Now, when you look at her through your peripheral vision, when you look at her with the rod cells only, the shadow seems more pronounced, and it becomes harder for you to separate out the mouth from the shadow around it. Let's uh, zoom in close and try this. If you turn your head to the side and look at her out of the corner of your eye with your peripheral vision, the shadow seems to become part of her mouth, and her smile becomes much more pronounced. When you turn and look at her square on, her expression seems to level out because the shadow just appears a shadow again. And so as your head turns, 
to look at this painting, her mouth actually seems to smile as you look away from it. And that, just an optical trick, is the secret to the Mona Lisa smile. But to understand that optical trick, think of what we had to do. We need to know the painting itself, the history of the painting. We need to know a bit about Leonardo and his activities. And then we need the scientific knowledge to understand how the science of sight works. And that's just a nice way, I think, of introducing the breadth of art history, not just in terms of the skills that are needed, but in terms of the different areas of interest that you can take uh, in pursuing your own art historical studies. So let's have a look then at how this study of art history would be structured in the Carleton program. I've organized the program in a series of concentric circles with the program itself, when I use the abbreviation Art and Architectural History in the center, and just to refresh your memory, here are all those attributes that I had mentioned earlier. Now, Art and Architectural History is situated within a larger circle known as the School for Studies in Art and Culture. And here you can see the banner for the SSAC website as well. It's a larger organization within Carleton that contains four programs, Art History, history and theory of architecture, music, and film studies. And this gives us the advantage of having the sort of weight and resources of a much larger department, even though art history itself is quite small, and which means you enjoy the benefits of a smaller program as well, lots of individual attention. Now, the School for Studies in Art and Culture is situated within Carleton University, which adds another layer of assets to the program. Those are the university level emphasis like um, experiential learning, our focus on career development, the global perspective the university has, and the capital advantage. The outermost circle is the city of Ottawa, which as you know is the Canadian capital. And although Ottawa is a good sized city, being in the capital means we have cultural resources at our disposal that are more extensive than you would expect for a city our size. Things like in the picture you can see right here, the National Gallery, for example, but also a variety of other galleries and cultural institutions as well. And so much in the same way that the SSAC gives the art history program the resources and reach of a larger program, the Capital Advantage gives Ottawa resources and reach of a larger city. And of course, I could add one more circle. Ottawa, as you know, is in the world itself, and Carleton does have a global perspective. It's a global perspective that's shared by the art history program, both in our courses and in our options for studying abroad or partnerships with other institutions as well. Now, how does art history work at Carleton? Well, let's take a look how art history is structured in the Carleton program. Again, the concentric circles will tell the story. The first year in our program is based around courses known as survey courses. These are large classes that introduce you to a broad survey, meaning a little bit of most everything of the history of art and the history of architecture from the ancient world or even the prehistoric world, as you can see here, all the way up into modern times. Obviously, a survey is sort of a cursory, quick overview, but it does give you a nice sense, a sort of a framework of how the history of visual culture works, and it allows you to then focus your interests as you progress through the program. And here is a graphic from the survey class that I teach. I'm using here the ancient Silk Road as a connective tissue to tie everything together. and just gives you a sample of the wide range of images you can be exposed to in your first year. Second year, you start to focus in more. And here we have our second year classes where subject matter tends to focus more around specific areas. So this would be in the sort of image you might see in a course on Chinese painting. My second year courses I teach tend to focus on Renaissance Italy and the, seventh, the European 17th century. We also start to introduce an experiential learning component with our art live workshop to go along with these classes with a greater emphasis on time and place. And here you can see from the Art Live workshop is, like I say, an experiential learning course. There's uh, one of our faculty, Professor Roy, with his class at the archives in the McCodrum Library. So they're actually getting their hands dirty, so to speak. They are getting their hands on them and starting to look under the hood and see how the knowledge that you study in the classroom is actually being produced. 
third year, things become a little bit more focused still. We get into sort of a closer look. And this is where you'll have your methods classes. These are where you learn the technical aspects of art historical study. And here you can see an example of a methods class at the National Gallery. Under this here, it's being guest taught by one of the National Gallery curators. So that's your capital advantage at work, right? Not everybody has a National Gallery that they can go to and schedule a class. In fourth year, we move into more advanced research, small-scale seminars, even some individual research, and I just thought it would be fun to throw in a picture of the Vatican archives there as a sort of uh, archetype for a primary source research. We have lots of archives here in Ottawa as well, where you can, if you're interested in doing that kind of primary source work, it can certainly be arranged. Here's an example of one of our fourth-year seminars taught by Professor Carrick looking at the Carleton University Art Gallery's collection of paintings by an artist named Scotty Wilson, but it's just a nice illustration of having this sort of hands-on experience to complement your classroom learning. We also offer the opportunity for upper-level undergraduates to even present their research through things like our undergraduate symposium. And here you can see a, an old undergraduate symposium poster that I found in the process of organizing an undergraduate symposium for the beginning of April. Now, I can't mention experiential learning without mentioning our practicum program. And this is a four-credit placement in an area institution that covers a wide range of possibilities. I am currently serving as the practicum supervisor, so I'm involved in, in placing students who are in the practicum program. And we, I can tell you, we do our best to fit each student to a placement that best accommodates what they're interested in doing. And I've just included a number of places where we do place people. You can see here on the slide, you have the Ottawa Public Art Program, the National Gallery, the Ottawa Art Gallery, Heritage Canada, architectural firms, uh, the Senate, libraries and archives, and so forth. The range of possibilities is as broad as the capital advantage will offer us. Now, on top of these for credit activities, we also have additional activities that allow you to take advantage of both Ottawa and the world around it. The pandemic has really put a, a damper on our ability to schedule things off campus. But as it appears the pandemic restrictions are beginning to wind down, you can look forward to these sort of trips and activities starting up again. And these are, of course, open to anyone in the art history or, for that matter, the HDA program. We also offer study abroad opportunities. Here I have some images from a study trip in England. I personally had been planning a study trip to Rome that was shelved when the pandemic came on, but this is something, all the groundwork has been done. As soon as Carlton clears us to travel again, this will definitely be on the table. So anybody who's coming into the program now will have that to look forward to in the next year or two. And we also have a program that we're partners uh, with the University of Warwick that offers us a few spaces in their full-term Venice program, where certain students are able to study uh, for Renaissance art and Italian culture for a semester in Venice. So these are just some of the study abroad opportunities that we offer that are part of that global focus in the Carleton program. Finally, I would have to mention our undergraduate society. CAHUS, the Carleton Art History Undergraduate Society, is very active. They organize a range of both practical and fun social activities. Here you can see examples of portfolio review and resume workshop for students who are thinking about life after their undergraduate, applying to other programs. They also organize parties and social events and things as well. So CAHUS is something I would strongly recommend that you get involved with. Now before I go, I should also mention life after art history in a little bit more detail. Art history graduates have the same opportunities that any graduate of a rigorous Bachelor of Arts program would have, with the addition of that visual literacy component I mentioned right at the beginning. And we have graduates who work in government, have gone on into architecture, in consulting, in teaching, research. We are very good at preparing you for graduate studies. We have students involved in graduate programs all over the world research positions, and of course, design. Thank you for your attention.